we've been recording the whole time. Never mind. Please well, please. I am uh, really very pleased to uh, to welcome the three speakers in this. That was a joint effort between Sylvia and myself. It's a, it's a session organized by both of us. And uh, the three speakers have a long standing contribution to Envirometrics for a long, long time. Uh, we start with Tonio and then we go after that with uh, uh, you, and then <laughs> you and you, yeah. you and, you. <laughs> and uh, I think we then we go to the third one, which is remotely by uh, uh, Grace. Yeah. So Tonio is uh, going to speak to us about uh, biodiversity, I believe. Yeah. And we are happy to hear what you are going to say. Okay. Thank you so much, Abdel and Silvia, that uh, gave me oh, this, oh, sorry, this opportunity to, to explain my, my project. Uh, I am uh, Antonio Di Battista, I come from Italy. Uh, this project, uh, this uh, work is a joint work with my colleague uh, from uh, some University of Italy, Roma Tre and uh, Mercatolo University of Rome. So, uh, I want to, talk, to point out that, that I am a statistician, not an ecologist and a biologist, but my main topic is to, to give the, the tools in order to measure the biodiversity and the diversity in, the, in the different fields of the ecological frame. So, but uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, my, my, my work. The title of the work is the functional design based estimation of a diversity profile. My speech, uh, uh, just a little overview of my speech. First of all, I give a little background of diversity profile, its evolution, evaluation. However, we, we show that uh, there are some drawbacks in evaluating the, the biodiversity using the, the diversity profile. So uh, I, I have a proposal using the functional data analysis because the, the diversity profile can be seen as a curve, a convex curve. So I move the reset, the, the, the the tools, the, 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 the evaluation of this in biodiversity the tools, in a functional data analysis. So a simulation study is, is done in order to evaluate the performance of our proposal and just to work on application in real data sets. So which is the problem? As you can, can see, it is very known that the diversity measure is proposed for some authors is seen as a curve, a profile, a convex curve. And this profile is used in order to have the ordering of the community or, uh, or to compare both communities. But in some cases, this curve intersect each other. So it's impossible to have an exact ordering or combination between two communities in order to biodiversity. So our idea is to move this uh, the standard approach, the profile, in functional data analysis. The functional data analysis is uh, uh, suitable tools in a statistical framework that give us the opportunity to evaluate the biodiversity for each point of the domain in which the profile varies. So, just to give uh, an overview of the, the issue of biodiversity. Uh, generally, we have an 
population, a biological population. This bioshock population is composed by capital N units, can be trees, animals. And uh, in these units are divided in K species. The diversity profile is a function of the abundance vector e a parameter x that varying in a fixed domain. So uh, the capital N is a vector in which for each species we compute the abundance of each species and x is a, a scalar parameter that varying in a fixed domain x, capital X. And uh, this scala reflects the different sensitivity to the occurrence of rare and abundant species. Practically speaking, the diversity profile is an issue, is a function, both the abundance vector and the parameter X. So, this is the slide we show the main index we use it in literature. And as you can see, uh, each of them depends on the abundance vector and is closed in a fixed domain. Uh, for example, the Patile case uh, proposed in 1932 is closed in minus one to one. And the behavior of the, this, this convex is, this is a convex curve constrained in the, in the domain. Uh, the, the analysis of the, uh, uh, a visual analysis of this, uh, this curve uh, give us the opportunity to evaluate the behavior of the, 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 the biodiversity uh, analysis. So, the problem is that the car generally intersect each other. Is so we have difficulty to, to understand which community is more biodiversity than another. So our proposal is to move in a functional setting, in a functional framework. But in this way, we encounter two main problems. The first problem is to give a sample design, a suitable sample design that allows us the opportunity to, to make the inference of the profile. The second problem is to ensure that the profile belongs to the functional space. If you want to work with the functional analysis, the functions must be belong to Hilbert space. We prove that the, the standard profile don't belong to Hilbert space. So we must to introduce a technique, uh, a tools that transform the, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, the standard biodiversity in a functional one that belong to Hilbert space. So starting from the first problem, you know, to give a sample design that allows us of a suitable uh, statistical uh, sample statistics, we introduce the Gregory Valentin approach that the study area is divided in plots. Each unit observed in each plot belong to the sample unit. So we can estimate for, for a single plot, both the abundance vector, and we ensure the asymptotic distribution of the abundance vector. In particular, adopting the, the, the same basic approach, we can compute the inclusion of probability as in equation three. And an uh, Ovis Thompson estimator of abundance vector is obtained combining both equation four and equation five. This approach allows us the opportunity to estimate the variance covariance matrix 
as well as in equation six. And with a, a replication of units, sample units in the area, we assure for large sample units, the consistency and asymptotic normality of the abundance vector as well in equation seven. Now, the biodiversity is uh, an estimation, estimated of biodiversity is a plug-in estimate of, of uh, MST. But uh, as I said before, this function don't belong in function as we can solve the second problem. That is uh, to transform the diversity profile in functional setting, functional factor. We named this new diversity profile the functional biodiversity profile, and we indicated F of a capital N and X. In order to solve this problem, we adopt a solution given by Ramsey that solving the differential equation 10 and under the constraint point in this in this equation, we can we can rewrite the diversity profile as an equation delay. So that means to be estimate the parameter P0 to 1, and, and uh, we estimate Wx, and this linear combination uh, give us a the biodiversity profile, but that belong to the functional space that respect the condition the inverse space. Uh, in order to have this dissolution, the first step is to estimate the uh, L to no basis function phi L as uh, the basis function is the approach to transform the function and constraint function starting from the point, the observed point, and uh, using the uh, condition 13, we can able, and minimizing the condition 13, we're able to estimate both the coefficient C of the uh, the linear combination of the basis and the parameter of the functional biodiversity profile uh, see before. Also, also in this case, the functional biodiversity introduced by our approach is a, a non-linear estimate of the unbiased, uh, the unbiased estimate of uh, n, so we must to reduce the, the bias and give a solution to uh, the uh, asymptotic convergence of estimate. In order to give this solution, we adopt the delta medial approach that under the condition that the function of biodiversity in the first two derivatives we, we are the, and using the convergent distribution, we can obtain the covariance matrix of the functional biodiversity, which the estimate are right in 15 and 16, and we assure the asymptotic normality of the functional biodiversity as in equation 17. Obviously, these results is very important because allow us to build point-wise and simultaneous confidence band for the curve for the functional biodiversity. This uh, equation 18 shows the point-wise where q alpha is the quantile for each point of the curve 
while in equation 18, 18 we have the, the, the confidence band where gamma alpha represents the, up, the supremium, the upper level of point, and we uh, this results allows it to be the, the, the far confidence band. Now, as I said in the introduction or in my speech, uh, I wanted to evaluate if our proposal is perform the performance of our proposal. In order to evaluate this, this performance, we, uh, we implement uh, a study, a simulation study, a square area, theoretical square area, is divided in 200 meters, is uh, is, um, is made for scenarios. The first two scenarios we consider 1,000 trees partitioned in K7 species and uniformly distributed in the area. In the second two scenarios, the top of 1,000 trees is divided in K13 species and it is suspected to be clusterized in the study area. So that is, uh, this picture show the, the, as the performance, the point are the trees, obviously. In each scenario, we have computed the real biodiversity profile, our our simulation is if our, our, if our approach is able to reconstruct these, these, uh, these uh, uh, theoretical uh, biodiversity. So the simulation study is implemented as well as this uh, way. Uh, first of all, we have a choice the the plot, we will use the circular plot, the radius 10 meters, and uh, we are able to compute the inclusion of probability in order to estimate the abundance factor using all these stones estimate. Uh, for each uh, plot, we are able to estimate both the abundance vector and the covariance matrix of the abundance vector. So we can use a mission of biodiversity, we, in this case, we, heal, we use the ILS number. And using our approach, we transform in the space the approach using our approach, using, it, using the, the Ramsey, Ramsey transformation, and we compute the functional counterparts of the biodiversity profile. Finally, the coherence function is computed and the confidence band for each sample, for each simulation, as done. For each scenario, we adopt four effort consistent and the number, uh, the sample size is 10, 20, 30, 40. And each uh, simulation is, is reproduced 1,000 times. This, has, this is the results. We use some index to evaluate uh, the performance. The first one is uh, to the relative bias. As you can see, each of scenario goes is consistent because the uh, the bias reduce increasing the increasing in the sample size so the second index is uh, to estimate the error using equation 21 as you can see for each scenario the increasing n the error tense goes to zero Obviously, 
the first two scenarios are better than the third and fourth D, because the first scenario we suspect the uniform distribution of the trees, while in the two, last two scenarios we are considered, but if you can see, the consistency is, uh, is very far. The last one index is uh, the coverage of uh, empirical coverage point-wise of the interval confidence, which shows nominal one 90%. Uh, as you can see, increasing for the first two scenario needs uh, a little sample size in order to have the right coverage. While if you use the second two scenarios, needs to increase the sample size to have a very well uh, coverage to respect on that one. But it's obviously, it's obviously. Okay, this is the result. Just a work uh, to, to, to to work about uh, the empirical uh, application. We apply the this approach, our approach in Bonis Forest in the CI Italy. This is the area of study area, the point area in green. And uh, this is the, the trees that's divided uh, about the the, the stem and in five diameters. This is the diversity profile in the relative confidence bank. I see I am going on. This is a little literature. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Tony. It's a lovely presentation. Okay. And I think we will uh, probably have questions in uh, the end. Okay. 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 We have an appointment at 12, so we'd like to just wrap up our session. Okay. So the more time we need, the more questions we can have. Uh, I close here. Sorry, you can see. Close here. Yeah, uh, just leave it because the, next, the other tab there is, uh, is Louis Paul's. Yeah, yeah, this way. This way. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tony. Yeah. Now we have Professor Louis Paul from Laval, and uh, he just came from Australia and has been, his accent is a little bit different. So just. <laughs> 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 Hopefully, I don't have to write to make an Australian accent on top of my French accent. It would be something <laughs> interesting. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I'm talking about is uh, uh, about uh, spatial temporal modeling of fish stocks. Um, I've been uh, involved in a, in, a, in a research project uh, of the Canadian Statistical Institute uh, entitled uh, Towards Sustainable Fisheries. And, uh, to this project, I collaborated with uh, with um, with uh, Hugues Benoit, uh, which is a fishery scientist at the uh, Fishery and Ocean Canada. And so this is the joint work I've done with, with him and some students. So the, the work I will be talking about today is uh, is the management of, uh, of the cod stock. So uh, uh, that is under the, the responsibility of Hugues. So this is a uh, uh, a cod stock in the in the northern Gulf of Saint Lawrence. So this uh, the one of the many tools that is is used are trawl surveys. Okay. So so basically you have a, you have a, a scientific uh, a boat that uh, that uh, has a, that uh, cast a fish uh, cast a net at the bottom of the sea and takes uh, all uh, all there is uh, there and it, it does this for uh, some time. And then, and then uh, brings all the catch on the boat. And then, what we are interested in in all the catches is the cogs. Okay, so we count the cogs, and uh, we have um, uh, at each uh, sample location there is a number of cogs that have been caught. 
The context of this talk is that it has collapsed. We all know that the car stock has collapsed in Canada, but there was a, a relatively important stock in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and this one uh, uh, also is experiencing problem. The assessment of this stock was based on the on a winter survey, and there were some in, <coughs> important implementation problem with this with the with the survey. And the idea of this project is to investigate whether uh, modern statistical approach such as spatial temporal models can 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 make up for the uh, deficiency of the survey. And auxiliary question also that were raised by some fishery scientists is whether the stock has moved south over a period uh, uh, in the in the 1990s. So this is the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Now we're in the eastern part of Canada, and so this is the uh, this is uh, so the blue here is uh, is water, and so this these are the locations. These are the locations. Here, these are the locations where we would like to uh, have uh, some some, some uh, <coughs> index of cod, uh, of cod abundance, and so to to show you the 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 deficiency of the survey. So this is the the nineteen ninety one lo location that were sampled. So all the <coughs> all the uh, all the western part of the survey uh, of the survey area. Has not uh, has not been observed. So can we can we make up for that? So the, the presentation is as follows. I I do some. Uh, so we have about sixteen years of cod uh, uh, trawl surveys, a total of uh, more than two thousand data points. So we specify uh, a spatial temporal model, and we we fit uh, we we fit uh, the um, the uh, the model with. Uh, uh, and our package TMB, and then we'll talk about prediction at our sample points, we'll investigate the time trend, and we'll do some discussion. So some descriptive statistics. So this is the, the cloud data. So here are box plots on the log scale, and you can see you can see that uh, there are extreme values. So for some uh, at some data points, there were some, some a very large number of cards that were cut. And also in this data set, there are 14% of zeros. Okay, so this is you cannot just analyze this with a, a regular, um, uh, regular say, a, a normal distribution because you want to, uh, uh, to to account for these zeros. So what we do is uh, we will do a generalized linear mixed model. Okay, a generalized linear mixed model. So so the, the and so we have a, a latent. Uh, uh, a latent spatial temporal process that um, that will capture say the uh, the uh, dependency uh, in the data and so this uh, this uh, spatial uh, temporal process it depends on the spatial distance so this is the spatial distance is the is the distance in, in kilometers between the two locations that were sampled and there is a time distance the time distance is the the number of years elapsed between between the, the observation of the two data points? So this is and so we use and uh, in the in the model we use an, an exponential function. So this is this is what the the, the correlation matrix looks like. So we have we have two uh, two data points i and j, and so there is a, a, a spatial distance and there is a time distance and there are two two parameters. Uh, one for for the spatial association, one for the time. So this is the base the base model that we will be uh, using. But uh, early on, we noticed that uh, there is uh, there is uh, there is more than just this going on. There is on top of that a nugget effect. In spatial statistics, a nugget effect means that besides the pure random process, you with uh, the correlation matrix sigma zero, there is some white noise, some white noise also in the latent process that uh, here I call V. And so, so this is this is the, the, the way I will be specifying in this uh, presentation the, the uh, latent process. So it has a sum of, a, of a, a pure noise process and a, a, a process with the spatial structure. 
So this is the base model. So we have we use a Poisson distribution to model this, and then given given of the the latent process u u and the the, the feed, also the white noise, we have the the log of the uh, of the um, the log of the Poisson parameters. Uh, conditional of the process is simply a, a linear combination of, of, of some fixed effects and of some random values. So here in the model that uh, that uh, we uh, ended up fitting, there were uh, 19 uh, uh, beta parameters, and there were four uh, uh, parameters for the, the different process. And so we have all together we have 23 parameters. So how do we go about estimating this? So this is really a challenge, estimating, uh, fitting these models. And so uh, in the uh, on the first day of the of the meeting on, uh, on Tuesday, we, some people were fitting a spatial model and they were using the INLA approach. So uh, with the Bayesian approach. So TMD is an alternative approach. It's not Bayesian, okay? It's really, it's using Lattice approximation to evaluate the expectation of the latent process. So this is, now this is a, a, an expectation over uh, uh, 2000 and so uh, a random variable. Or, uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, um, uh, TMB is, um, is, is, uh, is meant uh, to, uh, uh, <coughs> to handle these large problems, okay? It was developed in, uh, in Denmark uh, uh, there is a paper in the Journal of Statistical Software about this, it's, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, widely used in fishery research. And the, the, the approach it has for uh, uh, computing the marginal likelihood is to use Laplace approximation to integrate out the, the latent effect. And so uh, it, uh, it relies on, uh, on, uh, on the powerful C++ program for automatic uh, differentiation. And so, so you have to, uh, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit, uh, it's not that user friendly because for the version of TMD I'm, I'm using, you have to write your own C++ code, okay, to evaluate the conditional likelihood function. Uh, uh, including the random effect. Okay, so this is you have to feed this in the program, but then, then, uh, then it uh, it runs in uh, complicated uh, maximization problem. So it takes a while, but at the end of the day, you get uh, all you get the estimates, you get the random effect predictions, and you get uh, the, the 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 Fisher information matrix and so on. Okay, so this is. Uh, 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 some ex extra for the for the fit. So so I mean, I have I have my Trinity parameters. The 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 fixed effect in the model were not that uh, that significant. Okay, the only fixed effects that were significant were the two parameters associated to temperature. So in this model, uh, I have the, the the log depth. So the the depth of the crawl is a is an um, is an explanatory variable, and the other one is uh, is the, the water temperature. Okay. And so the the log depth that did not uh, produce uh, any uh, any uh, parameter any important parameters. And so the only significant parameters are uh, are those associated with the the temperature. So we can uh, say that the uh, these are the two two variance parameters. So the the total latent variance is, is rather large. It's, uh, it's five, and the 22% of this variance is white noise. You can see that. And also, you can estimate, uh, you can estimate uh, the correlation coefficient. So the temporal correlation between, uh, between uh, two successive years is 0.72. And so the spatial correlation 20 kilometers apart is 0.64. So this is, this is a summary of the, of the model that has been fitted. There was, uh, we saw that there was, there were influential, there were large uh, uh, data values. And so we wanted to investigate uh, whether uh, these large values were having an impact. So we tried to account for them by, by changing the white noise process, okay, by using a Q, uh, the, the so called QTGH transform to, uh, to have a, a white noise process with extreme value. So this is, this is a way. This uh, is a way uh, that we thought about to capture some uh, some extreme value that might influence the results. Okay. 
because when you look at uh, so th these are two sets of uh, of uh, of white noise estimates so this is the regular normal white noise and when you use the the the, the, the two k transform for the white noise you see that you can you, that some values get a, a white noise um, uh, prediction that are very large so this means that these values are really downweighted when you fit them on but in this particular data set uh, the end at the, i mean we did this, this investigation and so on and and uh, uh, so this is we did not capture much with uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, two pgh transform and uh, uh, so that's uh, that will be the end of it for now now okay now we have the um, we have the uh, the vector u and so uh, uh, the estimate of the vector u we then go up the beams because the beams are just white noise so they are not useful for, for predictions and so we use we do some kriging some we use kriging to predict uh, the the to predict uh, the uh, the latent process u at unsampled location and then you are we are able to uh, get l uh, l l at is a is a is a lot abundance prediction at, a, at an unsampled site okay so this is this is a, a basic uh, uh, Kriging uh, technique, and of course there is a there is a variability measure. Of, there is a prediction. There is a, a precision measure associated with this because maybe maybe this is not capturing anything. Maybe the the expectation of uh, of uh, u n given u at is uh, is just uh, it is just a constant that does not depend on u at if uh, u n is really far from uh, the sample points. Okay, so this is important to bear in mind this uh, this uh, this uh, this precision measure for the log abundance. Okay, so now we have uh, we are in business to do these uh, these these predictions. Okay, so this is uh, so we look uh, at uh, say 1980. Okay, and so this is the the sample point that I have. So the ear, so the the, the of course the size of the bubble is uh, is related to log abundance, and so this is the predicted. The, so this is the prediction of, uh, on the grid I showed you earlier, okay. And so and so if I look at uh, at uh, a year with a poor sampling, uh, you, this I have some prediction at the unsampled location, but the question is is this real? And uh, the answer is no, because when you calculate the prediction standard error, you will notice that the prediction standard error has the same. Magnitude as the uh, the prediction standard error has the same magnitude as the as the as the predicted values. Uh, so, but okay. Now there was this uh, last issue is the, the issue of the time span. So we want to know whether the stock has, has, has moved from north to south. So we we identify uh, 14, 14 uh, uh, station uh, in the in the northern part and 16 in the in the southern part and so we look at the time trend at these uh, stations and so in the northern part you can see that uh, at uh, the, the the stations one curve corresponds to a, a, the time the the the, the, pre the, the predicted u for a station the time varying prediction u and you can see that for a window just after uh, 87 maybe uh, or 85 between 85 and 88 maybe there is a there is a drop in the north but then and there is a, a, a raise in the south okay so for so that this seems to uh, to agree with uh, the fact that in, over that period the stock has uh, moved south but still if you also look at the southern zone you see also that uh, in the in the last in the at the beginning of the 90s the, the stock also has been uh, has been decreasing uh, without uh, the stock in, in the north, uh, without any increase in the stock of the north. So this is this is not uh, this is not uh, this. Uh, um, so th so th there, there has been a, a move, but uh, uh, maybe a move south, uh, even uh, uh, from from in, in the southern um, in the in the southern station. Okay, so the. Discussion. So the goal was to construct a spatial temporal uh, series for code abundance to help with spacing management. 
And the project is not completely successful because we were lacking a strong covariance that could predict abundance with some accuracy far from the sample location. Okay, so here I showed the I showed the the, the explanatory variable that we use uh, in the initial uh, model were temperature and log depth, but we tried other one like ice thickness and so on, but they were really weakly correlated to abundance. And uh, uh, so this is um, this 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 is this means that the, the project was not completely successful. Okay, so now what we have used in this in this uh, in this uh, project is a Poisson log normal model that feature uh, uh, spatial and random white noise and some models. These there are these these complex models are uh, can be easily fitted uh, by TMB and we uh, are still working on this business of uh, of uh, of detecting whether there are extreme values and influential values. Uh, for this model, and uh, so this is uh, still ongoing work that uh, a student is uh, involved in. So these are the references. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noel, for its uh, very lovely talk, and it's very <coughs> necessary with some useful, good questions for the Canadian government. Thank you. So now we go into the uh, third talk by Grace. I think she is leaving it, so we need Grace now. Hello, Grace, can you hear Abdul? Yes, hi, Richmond. Uh, it's actually Challen, my, my former student who's giving the talk. They're, they're talking, but I'm not sure that that's gonna be true because of how we... Can I'll you try again? The one, I'll be the one giving the talk. If it's okay. Okay, try again. Just speak. Um, can you hear me? Oh, there we hear you. Yeah. Good, good. That, that was yeah, awesome. I'm, I'm Grace's well now for, very former uh, student, um, uh, and I'll be giving the presentation. It's on my, the fourth chapter of my dissertation. Very good. Could you screen share for us? Absolutely. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes, okay, and everyone can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, everything is good. Please proceed, thank you so much. Thank you, so uh, I am uh, uh, Challen Hyman. I am well, now a, a PhD. I successfully defended my PhD on Monday. Um, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of South Florida in St. Petersburg, where I specialize in quantitative ecology and fisheries population dynamics. And today I'll be pleased to uh, present to you guys today a state-based modeling approach to blue crab population dynamics in Chesapeake Bay, specifically with the interest of looking at the effects of seagrass cover on uh, population dynamics of the species. Now, first and foremost, I'll uh, say something that is probably not lost on uh, uh, many of the folks who work on fisheries within this room, um, and that is that juvenile uh, habitats are an important component of fisheries productivity. And so, essentially, nursery habitats are habitats which disproportionately contribute more juveniles per unit area to uh, adult populations. And so, as a result, this is an important component, component of fisheries within both marine and estuarine ecosystems. Now, habitat degradation can reduce the uh, the extent and the uh, commercially exploitable uh, populations of different species within these ecosystems. And so, as a result, we should care about uh, essentially how our habitats are doing in these different ecosystems and how we should respond in terms of our fisheries management policies with respect to changes in these habitats, either increases or decreases in habitat availability. And we've known for a very long time that habitats and nursery habitats in particular are important for these different fisheries populations. However, these are often uh, uh, unfold at small uh, temporal and spatial scales at the sp scales of experimental uh, field studies. And often that's problematic because it's not very well aligned with scales at which are relevant for management, scales at the population level, uh, for two reasons. One is that um, it's not really clear how to include these different habitat effects into population dynamics models, or until very recently, the last 15 years it hasn't. And in addition, um, 
it's uh, there are scales or there are processes that unfold at very small spatial and temporal scales, which might not scale up to the population. And so both both uh, a high level population level modeling of habitat, as well as small scale habitat modeling are vital in terms of generalizing the nursery inference that we can make about with respect to how these habitats influence populations. Now, within that brings me to my study species, which is the blue crab, an iconic species within Chesapeake Bay. Uh, life starts with the blue crab. I'll briefly discuss its population dynamics, where essentially ovigerous or egg bearing females will migrate to high salinity waters and release their larvae. These larvae, these uh, which I have here is megalope, uh, essentially are swept out into the continental shelf where they undergo a period of growth and development for about a month. They then reinvade using uh, different uh, uh, climactically driven currents, wind driven currents that bring them back into these estuaries. They settle into nursery habitat and then continue their growth and development. And my question was essentially was what was the effect of nursery habitat distribution for the blue crab uh, at the or blue crab population dynamics at the scale of the Chesapeake Bay? And specifically for the blue crab, there has been a huge amount of uh, historical precedent underscoring the effect of seagrass habitat on the species. And so this was the habitat that I was interested in modeling. With respect to the data I used, I leveraged two different fisheries independent surveys. First, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science Juvenile Fin Fish and uh, Blue Crab Trawl Survey is a Virginia-based uh, survey that monthly or that conducts monthly sampling, stratified random sampling within Virginia waters for commercially important fin fish and vertebrate species. Then the Winter Dredge Survey is a survey that's in partnership with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, as well as the Virginia Institute of Marine Science that targets blue crab specifically in winter months when these animals undergo a state of torpor or limited movement, resulting in highly accurate uh, um, uh, samples, which we then use to derive indices of abundance. I then took both of these uh, fisheries independent trawl or these fisheries independent surveys and for juveniles and adults, juveniles were simply animals uh, less than 60 millimeters across and adults were anything larger than that for both surveys. And again, derived stratified a random sample uh, uh, based indices of abundance, so design based indices at this moment. Um, one thing that I'll comment on is that uh, before we go to actually publish, I will uh, be undergoing a number of differences with uh, respect to how I'll be treating these data in the future, and uh, I welcome any considerations from the audience uh, after I finish. Now for the actual seagrass data, I leverage information from my colleagues at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science uh, Submersed Aquatic Vegetation Laboratory. And from that, we derive time series of uh, two dominant seagrass species, the first being Rupia maritima, which occupies the northern waters of the bay, fresher water, and Zoster marina, which occupies the southern waters of the Chesapeake Bay, so closer to the mouth of the bay. Now for the actual state-space model equations, um, essentially I have two states for juveniles and adults. First, juvenile for juveniles, I essentially implemented a Bever Beverton Holt um, stock recruit relationship, where the numerator is simply the number of larvae produced as a function of the number of adult females in the previous year. And then for the uh, denominator, which includes the density dependent effects, I postulated that density dependence would be a function of seagrass habitat, where essentially I was expecting a negative effect on density dependence, meaning that the more seagrass that we had, the higher carrying capacity of the system, and the more juveniles we would have in the following year. These epsilon AT and epsilon um, JT terms are simply process error for my state equations. And for the adults, essentially, excuse me, the adults I had as a function of juveniles and adult, uh, adult juvenile and adult abundance from the previous year, while taking into account both fishery, uh, fishing mortality and uh, natural mortality. For the purposes of this talk, natural mortality is set as 0 0.9 based on several robust uh, uh, pieces of uh, literature on the species in the bay. And then for uh, the fishing mortality term, instantaneous fishing mortality was essentially modeled using a uh, the Bernal sketch equation, but also including a source of process error, ca uh, catch error associated with the uh, catches that were supplied to this model. Essentially, this term was uh, very similar to the variances that were postulated by the most recent benchmark stock assessment and also corresponded to uh, the currently the variance that would allow the model to uh, converge. Again, I will be uh, refitting this slightly for a, a log normal uh, process error or log normal catch error going forward. However, this was also scaled by a coefficient determined DT. Essentially, there was a change in the management of the blue crab after, before and after 2008, where before 2008, there was a, um, 
a, a winter dredge fishery that would essentially uh, increase, artificially increase fishing mortality in a way that was not necessarily uh, subsumed by catch. Essentially what was happening here was that the dredge survey uh, or the dredge fishery would essentially tear through the bottom and rip up a number of animals before they were actually harvested. And so catch didn't necessarily reflect the total fishing mortality assumed by uh, these different fishing practices. So essentially I divided this, uh, this fraction by this uh, DT term, and that was set to a coefficient uh, D naught for all years before 2008. And then it was set to one for all years after 2008 where essentially this fishery was banned. And so that uh, term was no longer relevant. And then finally, I was relating the state equation to our indices of abundance, which were derived from the uh, different fisheries independent surveys that I talked about previously. And these were uh, equipped with catchability terms as well as uh, process or um, excuse me, observation error that were derived from the design-based indices of abundance that uh, I calculated. Now, uh, finally, I implemented this state-based model using uh, STAN, which is a, uh, Bayesian, um, a Bayesian statistical software package that allowed me to uh, precisely implement all of these equations, uh, similar to TMB, which uh, the previous gentleman had, uh, had outlined for his model, which was fascinating. And um, so the, the benefit here was that I could include uh, prior distributions and uh, more precisely model the, uh, the precise nature of the relationship that I saw in understanding the dynamics of the species. Now, moving to the different models that I considered, uh, the above the previous uh, structure was consistent through all of my models, but essentially I was curious as to what aspects of seagrass were going to be most important to the species. So I generated five different models that I evaluated through cross-validation. The first was that essentially there was no seagrass effect. Essentially this, uh, this density dependent term was constant. The second model postulated that there would be an effect of seagrass in aggregate, meaning that it didn't matter what species we were looking at, just the total amount of availability of seagrass in the bay. The third model would um, essentially look at the essentially the density or the availability of Zostra, that southern species. And by the way, this uh, eelgrass species, these animations are going to be different. This first one is going to be just seagrass generally. The next one will be Zostra marina. And then the next one I'll be showing in a minute will be looking at Rupia specifically. And so the fourth model is going to be just that. It was looking at the availability of Rupia maritima, that northern water species. And then finally, the fifth model looked at both, essentially the separable um, uh, effect of both Austria and um, Zostra marina, as well as Rupia maritima. So this is distant or distinct from uh, the second model, which uses this as a single term, whereas the fifth model was looking at separable terms for these different seagrass habitats. In terms of how I selected for my model, I used re future out cross validation or one step ahead model predictions, where essentially I refit each of these five models 20 different times, running them from, exa for example, all the way to, 2000, uh, to the year 2000 and then predicting 2001 going from 2001 and then predicting 2002, et cetera. And essentially from these different diagnostics, I essentially calculated uh, estimated log pointwise predictive density, uh, where here essentially I predicated based on all of the previous data and the model structure and the previous indices of abundance from uh, both the juvenile and adult states running from all the way to uh, the terminal year and then predicting the second, uh, basically creating a posterior predictive distribution for the next year and then evaluating how each uh, sample, withheld sample of the next year for each of the different indices of abundance corresponded to those different posterior predictive distributions. And so essentially this was the criteria that I used to select my best fitting model. And then again, and then the final thing is for these equations, which I have here, essentially this YT term or this Y term corresponds to all of the different indices of abundance in aggregate. Essentially, I, I ran out of room on the uh, screen. And so this was a, a, me, a method of shorthand. Now, in terms of the results, uh, what I found was that my third model, the one that predicated that seagrass density would only be a function, or blue crop population dynamics would only be a function of Zostra marina, was by far and away the best fitting model. However, I would be remiss to, uh, if I didn't acknowledge that all of the models, including seagrass habitat in some way, shape, or form, greatly uh, outperformed the uh, model without any seagrass at all. So we can tell that seagrass is very important, and specifically, we can indicate that the Zostra marina habitat habitat appears to be the, the seagrass species that this animal is most responsive to.
In terms of the withheld values for each individual year, I derive both 80% and 95% Bayesian posterior predictive intervals. And then as a sanity check, for lack of a better term, I plotted the, uh, the withheld points for each individual index, and those are going to be in black, as well as the posterior distributions for the posterior predictive distributions for each of these indices. Now, anytime that you see a blue uh, posterior predictive uh, band, that's going to be one that actually captures the actually withheld value in that band. And anytime you see a red one, that means that the that that posterior predictive band did not capture the withheld value. And then what was a this is not necessarily a um, uh, the most uh, robust measure, but as a simple sanity check, we did find that around 75.7% of withheld values were captured within the 80% posterior predictive interval, and 95.9% uh, were captured within the 95% Bayesian posterior predictive interval, meaning that this model appeared to be quite robust. Now going into our results, these on the uh, left hand side of your screen are going to be the uh, essentially estimates of the state abundances for both juveniles and adults for A and B, and then the aggregate essentially juveniles and adult adults combined to so the entire population. And what you can essentially see is something that corresponds quite well with the survey data that we have, meaning that there was precipitous declines in the adult abundances from 1990 to around 2008 followed by punctuated recovery of this animal following uh, differences in management. The other thing that I wanted to uh, discuss were the essentially the covariates that were included in the model, as well as the posterior distributions with 80% with the 80% uh, credible interval for each of these different uh, terms. And the one that I really want to focus on is going to be that seagrass term. And we do indeed see a negative effect, meaning that essentially Costa Marina decreases the density dependent strength of uh, adults or of um, on this system, and it increases carrying capacity, meaning that the more seagrass we have, the larger the population that the bay can sustain. And I want to focus on this general uh, population trend because it's going to be in the next model, where here, after this uh, population trend, and by the way, the gray line. Uh, the, the black line denotes the, the median, and the gray band denotes the 80% credible interval for any state within the time series. Now, what I did going forward was I used a conditional simulation where I held the process errors for juvenile and adult states at zero, and then I projected what the population would be going forward under the minimum zoster that we saw in the time series, median, and maximum, to get an idea heuristically of how increases in zoster marina would correspond to where the population would asymptote at. And I held the catch for every single year going forward from 2023 to 2060 at what the previous catch was in the year 2022. And what you can see here with these, uh, both the median and 80% credible intervals, conditional credible intervals, I should state, is that indeed, as you increase the Zoster Marina availability held static throughout time, you do see an increase in the amount of the, the a positive increase in the population that the bay can support, and by extension, the maximum sustainable harvest that we can take out of the bay. Now, when we look at uh, both when we project forward using what we actually think is going to happen to Zoss Marina the Bay, we do see sort of a bad news story where the plot on the left side of the screen is simply going to be what the density weighted Zoster Marina cover is. So essentially what the availability of this habitat is in the Bay through 1990 to 2022. So observed values, as well as projected values under a no climate change, which is obviously unrealistic, and then a climate change, but nutrient reduction scenario, which is where we continue to uh, reduce the nutrients in the Bay and increase uh, Zoster Marina availability, as well as a no further reduction scenario. And then when we took from these different scenarios, we actually calculated a projection based uh, conditional projection based uh, approach where we simulated catch at maximum sustainable yield. And so what we have over here on the right side of your screen is both a simulated and uh, conditional posterior predictive interval for catch at maximum sustainable yield for all years from 1990 to 2022 and uh, as well as simulations for what the simulated conditional maximum sustainable yield would be for all of the seagrass scenarios going forward. These black dots are actually what the reported catch values are, and I'll get to that in just a second. They don't necessarily are indicating anything in relation to the fit of that curve. 
In addition to the best fitting model, I also calculated what the maximum sustainable yield would be for a model, the model that did not include any seagrass cover. And one thing that we found that was interesting is that one, obviously, if there isn't, if the population dynamics are not predicated on seagrass habitat, then the maximum sustainable yield is quite constant. The other thing that we found is that under a model which we <clears throat> demonstrated was not as well performing as our best fitting model, the model without seagrass covariates greatly over predicted the maximum sustainable harvest of this animal, meaning that we exclude these habitat covariates at our own peril because it will cause us to overestimate the amount of animals that we can sustainably harvest. The other thing I wanted to demonstrate is that when you look at the correspondence between the reported catch values in respect, with respect to maximum sustainable yield, and I plot, for example, the population dynamics of the, uh, the state equation or the state abundances of the adult state, what we see is that when the uh, essentially when the catches were greatly exceeding maximum sustainable yield, you see these de diminished uh, or these enormous decreases in the time series where you see catch or you see the abundance of these animals going down through time. However, once the uh, reported catch fell within the credible interval for the reported or our projected maximum sustainable yield estimates, this was essentially where the population began to rebound. There's still some uncertainty and they, it's still oscillating quite wildly, but this was once again a nice sanity check that this model was performing with expectations that were consistent with uh, data as well as reality. Now, in terms of uh, why Zostra, why Zostra Marina and not the other seagrass meadow, I have a number of different um, hypotheses for that and one that will indicate that more work is needed to be done. First and foremost, Zostra Marina is physically different from Ripia Maritima. It has larger shoot, the shoots are longer, and so it has more structural refuge. In addition, it persists in the water column quite a bit longer than Rupia Maritima, 80% of the year versus 30% of the year, meaning that this might be a nice mechanistic reason for why uh, this habitat is, blue crabs are more responsive to this habitat. And then finally, there's some spatial confounding, which is the part that I want to indicate is why future work is needed. Where remember, when we look at that map of Zoster Marina and Rupia Maritima, they occupy different parts of the Chesapeake Bay. Now, keep in mind that these animals as larvae are re-emigrating into the bay through the mouth, and they're settling into the first structurally complex habitat that they can find. And so as a result, if you're looking, if you're a blue crab megalope or larva and you're trying to settle in, you're obviously going to be more responsive to the seagrass that's closer to where you're actually ingressing into this bay. So we actually want to redo this model by using spatially segregated uh, variables, where we have Zostra Marina in the lower bay, Costa Marina and uh, Rubia in the middle bay or um, mid bay, as well as the same seagrass variables in the upper bay, so making this model considerably more complex, but decoupling the con potentially confounding effect between species and where their relative locations are. Now with that, uh, the implications of my work so far are simply that inferences of blue crab population dates are immensely improved by incorporating seagrass cover as an environmental covariate. The blue crab population is presently, and I want to underscore that, we think it's presently more responsive to uh, the density or the Zosta Marina availability than to that of Rupia Maritima, but that might change, particularly as Rupia begins to overtake Zostra as it is extirpated from the bay. And then finally, because future Zosta Marina projections under any scenario going forward suggest general declines in population abundance of blue crabs, we really need to be very careful when we are setting management expectations and policies going forward. With that, I thank you immensely for letting me present to you guys today. I really appreciate the virtual medium as I am way down here in Florida. And uh, I would like to thank all of my uh, my committee members, uh, Dr. Grace Chu. I'm not a statistician, but I learned immensely under her for my last four years. I thank you guys, and also for her recommending that I present to you today, as well as my advisor, Ron Lipschitz, who is a blue crab ecologist, and my committee members. The other uh, people I would like to acknowledge are my collaborators going forward when we begin to write this up, as well as several colleagues and wonderful individuals who helped me with my model refinement. Most specifically, John Honig, Michael Dowd, uh, Tom Miller, and Tim Miller, who helped enormously when I was parameterizing this model, as well as my funding sources. And with that, I will say thank you enormously for uh, letting me talk to you guys today. Thanks. Thank you, Shalin, for uh, very good. <laughs> Thank you, Grace.